Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we are going to be discussing or continuing our discussion on Chapter 5 of Political Ponderology by Andrew Lobachevsky. Um, this is the chapter on pathocracy. So a couple, several weeks ago, we covered the first bit in two shows. Now we're going to continue on. Um, there's a section in the chapter called More Contents on the Phenomenon that kind of gives, gives some interesting insights into what uh, Lobachevsky means by the, the term pathocracy and how it kind of applies in, uh, in real life. So in the last show we did on the topic, I mentioned the definition, or one of the definitions that Lobachevsky gives for, for a pathocracy, and that was the absolute domination um, of a government in a country uh, by what he calls pathocrats. But uh, right away he, he goes on to add that um, this, you know, this definition, this, um, this phenomenon that is like pathocracy at the summit of governmental organization um, does not constitute the entire picture of the mature phenomenon. So that's essentially what this section is attempting to do is to give um, a broader picture of what he considers the mature phenomenon of pathocracy. And so the first thing he basically says is that such a government has nowhere to go but down. And that is because by its very definition, the government will always be um, like the rule of a small minority. It's limited in numbers, essentially. So they're always limited to uh, like uh, a small percentage of the population. There will always be a majority of the population that will, um, that will eventually come into opposition with that government. That's why... Um, you saw, like, in a lot of the Eastern European countries in, like, b before the fall of Soviet, uh, before the fall of communism in those countries where it was essentially, like, ev all of the people were against the government. It was, you know, it became, they were, like, running jokes in, in those societies about, you know, what politicians were like, what the government was like. So you had this polarization of society, like we discussed in one of those previous shows, where it was, like, the instead of the polarization where that we see in like western democracies like uh, between the left and the right and that increasing polarization between two kind of large segments of the population um, or relatively large segments of the population you had this polarization of like everyone against the small ruling elite which were the the communist kind of elite class the 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 party essentially so right away he he tries to get into some of the the features that kind of explain that, or well, the the reasons for that happening, as well as the the techniques and the basically the things that the government has to do to take that into account in the in the way that they govern. So this the and of course um, you know for reference for people that are just tuning in again, he's using the the communist system as a. Um, you know, a starting off point. He's essentially trying to, to describe that system in the most general terms possible. So, the right after making that point um, about the pathocracy not just being um, the the phenomenon of pathocrats at the you know the summit of the government, um, he says in a pathocracy, all leadership positions down to village headman and community cooperative managers, not to mention the directors of police units and special services police personnel and activists in the pathocratic party, must be filled by individuals with corresponding psychological deviations, which are inherited as a rule. However, such people constitute a very small percentage of the population, and this makes them more valuable to the pathocrats. Their intellectual level or professional skills cannot be taken into account, since people representing superior, uh, superior abilities are even harder to find. After such a system has lasted, lasted several years, 100% of all cases of essential psychopathy are involved in, path in pathocratic activity. They are considered the most loyal, even though some of them were formerly involved on the other side in some way. So right there, that pretty much encapsulates um, the re well, one of the main reasons that Lobachevsky gets into for why the like communist bureaucracies were so inept is because there's uh, there's a certain type of selection process going on. So um, like for people you know versed in Jordan Peterson, he often talks about like competence hierarchies and how basically in any any kind of system like I use the example of like an orchestra, there are a very tiny percentage of the population that are proficient in any given like um, you know sphere of activity. So you sample 100 people in the general population uh, you know, for their 
proficiency on the violin, chances are none of them are going to be any good. It's a, it's only a very small percentage of the, of the population that can do anything extremely well. So in the, in in a case where people are relatively free to kind of self organize, you'll get a you know a, a symphony that manages to find these people and you know make a, a, a semi decent orchestra out of them. But if you change the selection process and you you make that a secondary feature, then you have to look at what your primary you know selection criteria are. So in this case, it's like the, the primary criteria for a government of this sort is to find someone who's kind of on the same mental wavelength as you, that is, you know, having a personality disorder of some sort. So you immediately limit your, your selection pool to like, um, you know, 6 to 10% of the population or something like that. And you can only hire from that pool. So the point Lobachevsky is making is that once, the, once that procedure has come into practice and it's kind of this organic thing that just uh, that that happens in the lead up to epithocracy we've just described those phases in previous shows so once you get that you you have the pool that you've selected from but within that pool you're not going to have the the people who are actually competent in uh, for the positions that you're putting them into so that's why um that's so so for the pathocracy, they've got this small pool of people that are very important to them. Like they need to find all these people who have certain personality disorders, but they're not actually going to be very skilled in the positions for which they are like uh, selected. So um, that's that's one. Well, that, so that's a reason for the incompetent incompetence, the ineptness of the system, and also for why. There, for why, as he said, 100% of cases of essential, of essential psychopathy eventually get into these positions. And, uh, you know, just for reference, when he says essential psychopathy, he's just describing what we in the West understand as psychopathy. Um, so this isn't just like serial killers. It's like, uh, you know, corporate psychopaths, just psychopaths in everyday life, people who aren't necessarily extremely criminal, but who have the psychopathic personality, just uh, that lack of emotion and that kind of ruthlessness in everyday life. So... Um, that's the that's the first point, and that leads to um, to this next point that um, he points out that no area of social life in under these conditions can develop normally. So he lists like economics, culture, science, technology, administration. That this system, when you've when you have this selection process that has gone on, um, that system progressively paralyzes every sphere of human activity because you've you've removed that that um the, you've removed the like the freedom or the natural ability of people to self-organize into into things that uh that work you know more or less because it's it's never a perfect process but we still you know we still manage to to um create groups and, and self-organize in 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 the sense that we um, assign ourselves and each other roles within a group. So some people naturally take on a leadership position. Some people um, naturally um, are more comfortable just, you know, just following orders. And and you see this, and you, for all its flaws and for all the interpersonal problems, you end up getting, like I said, relatively decent symphony orchestras or any other type of like social group that uh, that is all, um, you know, oriented towards the same aim. That can't happen in a pathocracy, or well, it, it can happen, but under s certain specific conditions, and that's what he gets into next, because um, one of the things that he points out is that um, there are for for the reason, uh, well, because of this system, because of the selection process, because there is this like fundamental divide between the like the. the the, the inner worldview of the, the leadership and just the vast majority of people, they're naturally at odds. And you have these inept and incompetent people in positions of power. So how can anything get done in such a situation? Um, the way that Lobachevsky describes it is that there is a, uh, what he calls a special kind of pedagogy that goes on, a, a special kind of like teaching. And this is that normal people have to adopt the role of um, essentially being psychopath whisperers like they have to learn how to how to um, instruct their incompetent leaders in such a way as to not incur their wrath on them so basically it's a it's a i don't even know how to do that but uh but it's a way of um just being 
extremely careful and like circumspect, circumspect in the way you approach, you know, your social interactions with these kind of people and, and hinting at certain things that need to get done without like stepping on their self-importance or anything and just to, in order to get the, the basic minimum done. And so he gives the example of like, um, of the kind of conditions that they're working in. And he gives the, the, this example of like the, the factory builder who, um, who's required for, you know, building a factory and getting it up and running. He says in such a system, it's like those people will be tolerated, but as soon as their work's done, they'll be, you know, fired, thrown out, um, you know, maybe even arrested. It's like, because the, the, they're needed for their competence for that specific role, but they don't fit within the party system necessarily. They're not, they don't have the essential makeup in order to, um, to be part of that. So they just get, you know, discarded after use essentially. So, um, <clears throat> this is, this is the way that Lobachevsky describes that phenomenon. He says that normal people must develop a, develop a level of patience beyond the ken of anyone living in a normal man's system, just in order to explain what to do and how to do it to some, me to some obtuse mediocrity of a psychological deviant who has been placed in charge of some project that he cannot even understand, much less manage. This kind of special pedagogy, instructing de deviants while avoiding their wrath, requires a great deal of time and effort, but it would otherwise not be possible to maintain tolerable living conditions and necessary achievements in the economic area or of intellectual life of a society. Um, even with such efforts, pathocracy progressively intrudes everywhere and dulls everything. So these are the kind of conditions he's, that, that develop in such a system. What he's basically saying is the only reason such a system um, can survive at all is because of this phenomenon, because there are competent people who, who just through like sheer, like survival, uh, like survival instinct have to learn how to instruct their incompetent, you know, overseers in order to just get the basic things done. So he's, uh, he's essentially saying like, so in this, you know, in the socialist communist systems that were in place in these countries, the only reason they managed to to succeed at all was because of this very phenomenon. So um, I thought that was a pretty interesting look at, um, um, well, it's a psychological look at a, at a phenomenon that's often only looked at in terms of like economics or politics or, um, um, you know, sociological methods. It's like, so you'll often, you know, see the debates about, you know, socialist versus capitalist economics or like the totalitarian systems of and uh, totalitarian and authoritarian systems versus, you know, free democracies and things like that. But those, those labels and those levels of analyses don't really get to the, um, the, the kind of the heart of the matter, which for Lobachevsky is like the psychological matter. It's the matter of the individuals involved in the way they actually interact. So in this case, it's, it has to do with like the types of individuals who are interacting at, you know, at the level of, you know, a worker and, and the, the, the kind of political bosses or, you know, factory bosses that he's dealing with. Um, it's at that level and like the differences between them and the, the, the methods of interaction and communication that have to be like developed that allow like any kind of economic progress or even just tolerable living conditions, as he said, to, uh, to manifest and to occur. So, um, anything, do you guys have any thoughts on those points so far? Uh, yeah, something that <clears throat> comes to mind is a, an analogy that he, he makes early in the chapter. I believe it's in this chapter where he compares the pathocratic system to like, imagine like a, a farm, uh, being run by people who are colorblind mm -hmm. and, so they, they decide that, you know, they take over the farm and they don't want any red berries to be picked, yet they're colorblind. They can't see, they have no idea which, you know, what color the actual berries are, but they, so they need go-betweens in order to actually tell the people which berries to be picked. So I thought this was like a really useful analogy. And then you could also make a similar analogy because you keep on bringing up the orchestra. It's a similar thing, you know, with a, you know, a conductor who is deaf can't hear the music, but he, and he doesn't like music, but he takes over. And so he decides, you know, this is, you know, this is the kind of music that we'll play. And he has no idea what kind of music is going on, but he wants the power. He wants the prestige of being a conductor, but he needs go-betweens to tell him, you know, you know, how things are actually being, you know, conducted, even though, you know, since he's deaf. And I think that's a really good analogy because that's 
what you're dealing with is, you know, psychopaths, they just, they don't have the senses or they don't have the sense for like the intricacies of human life. And they're, they're just confused, bewildered and filled with hate for all of the, you know, just the normal goings on of human life. So, you know, when it comes down to it, they need people, you know, in order to maintain this, their position of power, they have to create some sort of a symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. with all of the, you know, just with the world of normal people, mm -hmm. even though, you know, they'll do that and then just turn around and just, you know, kill them off in, you know, just a mass bloodshed just in order to remind everybody who's in charge. You know, that's, that's something that you could, you saw quite a bit of in the communist system. You know, just describing the way that uh, Lobachevsky describes the, uh, you know, the, the really, you know, the, that special pedagogy that you're, that you're discussing of trying to teach some obtuse, mediocre, deviant how to do something. Well, you know, it sounds comical. You know, it really, it sounds comical until you put yourself into the position of this person who that's their livelihood. Maybe it wasn't their livelihood before, but now it's their livelihood and perhaps they have, you know, some patriotism, they need to feed their family. And, you know, it's like in a time of war or something, they, uh, it's life or death that they get some project done mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, yeah. directly above them is someone who has life or death power over them and who is just oblivious, right. completely oblivious to a, the importance because that's and like, a, you know, those kinds of values of the importance of life and death struggle, that, those are just normal human emotions that these psychopaths don't have, don't mm -hmm. care about. But then also, you, if you say something in the wrong way, you're dead. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's just this, you know, walking this fine line of saying things in the proper way, you know, being like really trying to put yourself in the shoes of this obtuse, mediocre, deviant, and understanding like how you can how you can word things in such a way that things can get done even if it's you know just mm -hmm. in the most mediocre way possible but that you know that you don't lose your head because of it right well you brought up a a good point that uh that i that i hadn't uh like you know made clear in my original you know when i was originally talking about this is that it's not just like if you take the example of a factory worker it's not just that the factory worker or the you know the the builder or you know whatever specialized um, person is involved. It's not just that they they want to do um, their job well because because they want to and because they like it's it's their place to do it and and um, you know they feel an obligation. It's not just that they have to convince the you know their boss um, to in a way to get those things done. It's that they have to because it's actually the the boss. On the one hand, the boss is saying you have to do this, but the boss is so incompetent that that the that they can't just do it. They have to convince him of the ways in which to actually get it done. So on the one hand, they 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 have to argue for themselves in order to just do their basic job well or like correctly, but they also have to do it because if they don't, they'll be punished. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's a double bind where they they feel like they they can't get their job done because they're blocked essentially by the incompetence of their boss. But at the same time, if they don't get their job done, then it's their head on the line. So that really, I think, hopefully, that kind of makes clear the 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 like live or die um, like situation that they're placed in and the emotions that that must um, you know that that must provoke. Well, and also knowing that it it could be totally arbitrary as right. well. Like you're probably going to be killed anyways. You know, just if he decides that you're you're dead or you are, you know, so you're. You're, mm -hmm. you've you know spoken to him wrong or whatever they you could yeah. just be shipped off to the gulag as well and you know then you add in the conditions you know you're, you're probably working in which because of the the paralysis of the entire you know community the entire society are probably dreadful you know i can't imagine like how many hours you're working and knowing that the work that you're doing is being done wrong and so horribly inefficiently that you know that it's for nothing, mm -hmm. you know, that you add all of those, those little details in and it creates for probably the most challenging, uh, situation that mm -hmm. you can pot that you probably live, live in right? just because you, the kind of split second decisions, the kind of listening mm -hmm. to your gut, you know, understanding other people, understanding, learning how to separate people you can trust from, you know, mm -hmm. who you can't trust, mm -hmm. being able to tolerate 
un, just completely unreasonable demands while knowing that in the end it's for nothing and it could just all blow up in your face anyways. And, you know, you'll probably, you know, be slandered or, you know, pe- you know, you'll, you'll die a, just a, a worm in the press or whatever you, you, or they won't even, nobody will even know what happened to you. Mm-hmm. You know, it just creates for this, uh, you know, a picture of, you know, this really bizarre kind of pedagogy on the other end too, for the human being involved. Yeah. Well, the, uh, Solzhenitsyn gives a lot of examples of this kind of thing in uh, Gulag Archipelago, um, like so in the Stalin era of these kinds of things going on in in factories and uh, and how even the the competent you know people the people that would come in to solve problems they might be the ones or they often were the ones that were then rounded up as um, like saboteurs and. Um, you know, counter-revolutionaries, like whenever, um, you know, they might not meet a quota or something or, or the, you know, the, the, the like economic performance wasn't doing as well as possible where then they needed like the, the leadership, the party then needed a scapegoat. So they would, uh, they would talk about all these saboteurs and wreckers, um, you know, people deliberately sabotaging the economic and like uh, productive efforts of the, you know, the workers when often, and then the people that they would go after were the ones that were actually doing their jobs and the ones that were actually responsible for anything good in the system. So it, it's this completely Kafkaesque nightmare where the like, the people that are least deserving of like the wrath of um, you know of the party of the of the, the you know the the leaders are the ones that get the worst punishment. So it's uh, this gets back to the you know, the example you gave of the you know working on a farm and only, and having to pick green berries instead of red or green tomatoes instead of red tomatoes yeah. it's like um it's just living in this completely arbitrary world where um like the way lobachevsky describes it is that when this kind of government and like entire socialist system is first kind of solidified it's a it comes as a complete shock to the system and um the and he he says that social ties basically get disintegrated so you lose your social ties you know partly because of the the paranoia and the distrust and uh um that's essentially what the system is designed to produce is just this um complete dissolution of um normal social organization so that's the first shock like and and it's a complete shock so all, all of a sudden you're alone you know you can't you can't share your your feelings even with um your closest family, your loved ones, because it might be your kids, it might be your wife that gets fed up with you and uh, and you know goes and talks to the the party or the or the police and gets you arrested. So there's the at at first there is this complete dissolution of social ties, but um, as Lobachevsky points out, that's only in the in like the first phase. As years go on, the social ties redevelop because that polarization happens. It's like the majority of people real they they realize who they can talk to after a while. And so they end up talking to each other, and they end up developing strategies and and um, um, and ways of reconnecting that are um, that manage to work within the system. So the way he describes that is, um, let me just read a little bit here. He says that. Oh, let me find the page. Um, so he says during the initial shock, the feeling of social links between normal people fades. After that has been survived, however, the overwhelming majority of people begin to manifest their own phenomenon of psychological immunization. Society simultaneously starts collecting practical knowledge on the subject of this new reality and its psychological properties. Normal people slowly learn to perceive the weak spots of such a system and utilize the possibilities of more expedient arrangements in their lives. So they find the, you know, the weak spots in the system, the kind of like the, the blind zones, the, the blind spots of the system, the places in which they're actually able to, uh, to function normally, and then they can exploit those for their own purposes. And that might be, you know, even just talking together about how to deal with, you know, the, the obtuse, um, you know, incompetent that's above them in the social structure. So they begin to give each other advice in these matters, thus slowly regenerating the feelings of social links and reciprocal trust. A new phenomenon occurs. Separation between the pathocrats and the society of normal people. That's the polarization I was talking about. The latter, that is the normal people, have an advantage of talent, professional skills, and healthy common sense. They therefore hold certain very advantageous cards. The path, the pathocracy finally realizes that it must find some modus vivendi, 
or like mode of living, mode of life, living together, or relations with the majority of society. And he puts it in a quotation. After all, somebody's got to do the work for us. That's the kind of the mentality of the of the the party members, because psychopaths are you know innately. Um, parasitic. It's like they don't they don't like working, and they expect other people to do the work for them, and they expect to get the you know the the fruits of other people's labor essentially. So um, that phenomenon then then leads to um, what Lobachevsky describes as like a, a further phase in the process of the of pathocracy. So in the previous shows, we talked about like the first three phases of pathocracy, which were kind of like the development of it. Uh, it's like you know it starts with the the schizoids and the ideology, and then it gets slightly more pathological with like a um, you know certain per, like kind of more more antisocial um, personality disordered people acting as like spellbinders and kind of um, like brutalizing the system, and then like a um, then the, the then the third one would be like the, as the psychopaths gain more um, gain more influence within the the social movement. You know, starting out as like low level kind of enforcers, and then uh, through like manipulation, through gaining like positions of uh, of extreme influence within that system. So then, once that government is like in place, we have this like initial shock, which is like a which is the shock of you know terror. And intimidation, uh, coercion, torture. The this is what we saw, or what we see in like the first years of the Soviet Union with like uh, Lenin and Stalin. Just a complete kind of like um, butchering of the the social the the social fabric at that time. But then after some years of that, as this polarization happens, it leads to a new phase, what he calls the dissimulative phase. He compares this to um, like a patient in in psychotherapy that has some like serious problems, but he says it's like, it's a common phenomenon in, in psychotherapy where uh, a patient of this sort will enter a, like a dissimulative phase, a lying phase, basically where they pretend that they're, they're all better. They pretend that they're normal and they live this kind of this fake life where they're pretending to be normal, even though they, they know they're not. Um, it's a complete act. And this is the, this is kind of a phase that happens on a, on a, a mass level as well. And, um, and it can be seen, this is, this is basically the PR phase of the pathocracy where the, the, the pathocrats have, have figured out an arrangement with people. It's like, okay, we need you. Um, and so we're going to kind of give you, you know, we're, we're going to make certain concessions. Um, we're going to give you certain things and you're going to keep working for us essentially. And it's, so it's kind of like this, uh, this, uh, you know, quid pro quo relationship kind of develops but at the same time um the the pathocracy needs to maintain their image as just a different form of government um to the international community and so this this affects kind of the who they choose as diplomats who they choose as the public face of the the government and um also um oh what was the other point that um <clears throat> Well, I'll find. Uh, I'll have to find the, the the point. I forgot the last uh, the, the last feature I was trying to get to, but um, that's. Or go ahead. Well, so uh, I was thinking of um, the types of points that uh, Jordan Peterson has been making recently, uh, specifically regarding some of these dynamics, and um, one of them is that you can't think about equality without also considering hierarchy. Uh, competencies or competencies of, of hierarchy. And so his main uh, point that he's trying to get across um, is that people are, on the far left especially, in decrying the amounts of um, uh, un unequal wealth distribution, and, and, uh, which admittedly is a problem, and, he, and he'd be the first to admit that it is a problem in Western society, are not taking into account the fact that in many cases, uh, the, the reason that things are structured the way they are, even if they're unequal, even if they're unfair in, in many instances, is because there are hierarchies of competence uh, where, where capitalism is working well, where the encroachment of, uh, of monopoly capitalism and corruption hasn't gone full bore. There, there is something to be said for the fact that there are people in positions of power who are good at their jobs 
and mm -hmm. who aren't tyrannical and who aren't in it necessarily for the, uh, the acquisition of power over others. And it's very interesting, there was a, this interview that Abby Martin had with, with a historian recently where they were criticizing uh, Jordan Peterson for his use of the term cultural Marxism. And, um, and of course, they were nitpicking and, and saying, well, Jordan Peterson doesn't understand Marxism. But, but what they seem to be missing, and, and which seemed to me to be the crux of the matter, is the whole idea that, uh, you know, if you, if you take away the term cultural Marxism, uh, I, think, I think it's almost interchangeable with pathocracy, um, especially in the, in the way that uh, Lobachowski uses the example of a, of a kind of socialist or communist regime that ostensibly is uh, in power because it's supposed to uh, care about the worker when really it, it, it's become about the, the party member or the, the person who is in a position of power. And, that, and that's exactly what he's been pointing out. Uh, to everyone, that this is really just a kind of a, a cover for, uh, for those people who are using the benevolent, um, altruistic idea of, of socialist policies um, to, to accrue power for themselves. So uh, in that sense, I think Peterson is a kind of latter-day um, ponderologist. Uh, and and I, I wish he would um, I wish he would sometimes even you know we've heard him say uh, uh, or evoke the the uh, psychopaths who are who are in positions of power before but I think it would it might even make his case stronger uh, if not make him uh, more subject to targeting on the path of the left because you know for him to to say that people are acting pathologically in the context of these radical left political movements would, would bring him under a, a tremendous amount of fire. Uh, but then again, he would be stating things in a much, uh, much starker way. Um, so uh, that the hierarchy competencies, especially in the context of this conversation, is, is where uh, these uh, Kind of character paths and and uh, schizoidal types who who lead these movements um, are exactly out to destroy because it's not about competency it's about the accrual of power to themselves and that's where I think he's he's quite successful um, for those who are willing to listen to him and not not get a knee jerk reaction to the fact that they're criticizing leftist ideology mm -hmm. that that's that's the big takeaway from his work if we want to update political ponderology to the types of phenomenon that we're seeing today right well and, go ahead yeah well and just one other point you know you, you said that at some at some point in the process of uh you know society fracturing uh, and people kind of not talking to one another, and, and the bonds of, of even families being broken. It's very, uh, it's very sad to notice that you have right now, um, this may have been brought up in a pr prior show, you have this kind of uh, children's movement um, about the environment, especially in Europe, but also in North America where they're being encouraged to take a day off from school and protest. Um, and what happens is they're, they're ostracized by their teachers and by their uh, fellow students if they don't want to participate in this. It's become this kind of um, this very divisive issue where the thinking, as the thinking goes, if you're not, uh, if you're not out there uh, championing the the cause of um, saving the earth in the name of global warming and the climate crisis exclamation point uh, then you are somehow uh, part of the problem and um, and so th there is this kind of flavor of pathology that has been instilled and and drilled into the minds of uh, Western society right now and this is just one way it's happening um, but it's, it's insidious and it's really sick to, to hear these stories of, of children who are being punished and ostracized by their teachers, 
bullied by their fellow students because they don't agree with or are willing to go along with uh, going out, taking a day off from school and, and protesting and being part of this political movement. When, when in fact, whether they know it or not, they're, they're correct in, uh, in not falling prey to these ideas that are entirely politically motivated mm -hmm. and, and steering a whole segment of society in the direction of emotional fervor, um, all based on lies. So uh, there's a lot of prescient information right now that we can, uh, that we can look to political panorology to uh, kind of decode and deconstruct these things that we're seeing uh, in the here and now. Well, that just uh, reminded me of this quote that I recently read in this book on uh, socialism by Christian Nemitz. He's giving a summary of Jonathan Haidt's work and uh, talking about the dangers of political self-segregation and hyper-tribalism. And so on that, he writes, in such environments, people with similar political views cease to be just a loose alliance and become a moral tribe which commands loyalty and punishes dissent. People with opposing views, meanwhile, cease to be just political opponents and become an enemy tribe. Their views cease to be just wrong and become actively malicious. So this is actually the, the environment in which, um, like what Lobachevsky would call a pathocratic social movement, um, would thrive. Because they, they managed to not only feed on this, um, this hyper tribalism and the and the segregation between like the po hyper polarization of groups like they feed that they they feed into it they they egg it on because they they essentially want to use that as the the fuel um, that that uh, basically you know propels them to the their rise to power that's what the you know the Bolsheviks did that's what the they were uh, like in the in the in Russia at the time like in the early 1900s, it's like there, there were all these socialist communist groups and like, and revolutions even, there were like multiple revolutions and the, like the fracturing of society that they caused was the, was what the, the Bolsheviks used to rise to power. They used that, um, that vacuum in order to place themselves on top and gain that kind of supremacy. And that's essentially that, that like, that is the danger. That is the ultimate danger that, uh, these phenomena, uh, pose to, um, like the societies in which we live, where we're seeing these sorts of things. That's why panerology, I think, is so important. It's because it is that vision of hell that Peterson talks about that that you should keep in mind in order to avoid at all costs, you know, by by any means necessary. It's like we do not want to go in that direction. But uh, the, the the people involved in these in this hyperpolarization, they may even have some some vague fear of that hell, but it isn't properly defined, and because it's not properly defined, they can't. They can't successfully prevent it from coming about. In fact, they they will um, like almost inevitably feed into it because they can't understand it properly. So that's why you can it, it's it's possible for uh, like a, a pathocracy to develop to develop on the right or the left. It's not like either one is intrinsically right or or wrong. It's like depending. It's just depending on circumstances. Whichever one comes on top can be manipulated into this kind of um, like total. Um, degradation of like of human society, and um, on the like the point you'd made before that, I think that um, leads into the other point that I was uh, that I'd forgotten about uh, about um, the, the, this the, the result of this kind of polarization that happens in a pathocratic society is that um, the the point I, that I wanted to make is that this results like this dissimulative phase that Lobachevsky's talking about essentially results in kind of like a um a more benign version of the pathocracy so this would be like the like the soviet union in, in like the 70s and 80s which isn't isn't comparable in many respects to like you know in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s even like the in stalin's era for instance where it seems like it's not as bad, right? Well, and part of the reason for that is because that that relationship did develop. That what you know, Lobachevsky calls the modus vivendi between the you know the people and the and the the the, the leadership, and um, so that's why you get uh, that's why you can get like um, like the Soviet Union in the in the seventies or eighties, or like the GDR, like uh, like East Germany, which was never as never as like um, as brutal and like genocidal as like this as the Soviets were in the early years it's like they they 
they, they seem to have gone straight to the like the dissimulative phase, um, avoiding those that kind of early tumultuous period of of um, like the development of pathocracy. Well, partially because uh, it was probably. We'll get into this when we discuss further in the chapter on pathocracy, but Lobachevsky basically de um, details certain different um, means by which pathocracy is um, like affected in a certain country, whether it's by revolution from below or like a, um, kind of like an infiltration of um, basically like revolution from above where the, the leadership is kind of converted and then institutes the, you know, the new system, the new social system from the top, avoiding that, you know, initial like a revolutionary period and there's a couple others but um but in that context one of the things that i wanted to to bring up is this this idea of like of socialism um as as like this ideal that is then kind of um um perverted into something that like the the socialists themselves say well that's not real socialism and there are several like reasons for that um that go deeper than i think than um, even like the analysis of someone like uh, Peterson or even like Slavoj Žižek when he's talking about these sorts of things, is it that like there is the <clears throat> the well I'll, I'll just give like Lobachevsky Lobachevsky's point of view on this. It's like um, well I'll try to combine a, f uh, a few different points of view. So like in the in the thirties, for instance, um, there was the image of the Soviet Union as this workers' paradise. To the point where a lot of like Western socialist pilgrims would go over to the Soviet Union and come back and just singing the praises of the Soviet Union, talking about how it is this paradise and Stalin is this great leader and he he's not a dictator like he he is the representation of the people and the people the, he is the people and the people are him and he is he is like the Soviet Union and he's he's not a dictator. What actually happens is you have all of these like workers collectives and every week they 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 meet and they talk with the leaders and they discuss their problems and uh, and then the leaders listen and Stalin listens and then he institutes policies that uh, that are in line with the people and so like these Western leftists and socialists would come back just like singing the praises saying there's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. This is the way the world should be. This is a a new way of a new way of society, a new life, like a new society. This is this is what we should be striving towards. Um, of course, um, totally unaware of everything going on beneath the surface, um, making, well, not even totally unaware, um, because a lot of these, like a lot of the information about the, what was really going on was available, um, but the, but the, like the, the Western socialists were, they, they made excuses for it. They, they were like deliberately and like willfully blind about the situation. So to the point where they would, um, like they would downplay the gulag and say, "Oh, well, it's just a re-education thing. It's like the, the people there are happy, and and you know, once this progresses, once they're re-educated, there will be no crime because um, and it's really like a vacation. You know, they get to work outside, and uh, it's really nothing. I, well, people say that like the like the Holocaust deniers will say the same thing about the you know the um, the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. You know that oh that you know they were." <laughs> they weren't so bad, um, totally ignoring everything, you know, all the horrible, you know, aspects of, of that, that type of imprisonment, especially when you consider people like, you know, Solzhenitsyn and, and the circumstances by which he was put into the gulag for nothing, for criticizing some, like, the, the Soviet, like, military leadership, um, just, ma just making a criticism. It's like he didn't do anything, and he was put in for years. But, but anyways, so you have these, these groups, uh, like the... There was this there was this perception of in the early years even, which were arguably the worst years, um, like in terms of just like torture and death and um, just the, the terror that was instituted. You still have people that were um, like convinced that this was uh, like a workers' utopia, a workers' paradise. But then, um, like as things progressed within the Soviet Union, that that actually led to the the more benign form in like the 70s and 80s. But by the 70s and 80s, like the reputation of the Soviet Union was totally shot; that it didn't have very many supporters in the West anymore. It's like you, you didn't have in the 70s and 80s. You didn't have many Western leftists leftists looking to the Soviet Union as this workers' paradise. Um, like there was kind of like a general. Um, recognition that the system wasn't so great by then they'd moved on to like other socialist countries and um, yeah, and that's the well that's the point in this book the this Christian Nemitz book actually is that um, like the the point he makes about all these socialist experiments is that in the early in the early days what he calls like the honeymoon honeymoon period there was um, like widespread 
um, support for and um, and like pilgrimages to like the the new Soviet the new socialist experiments, and people would come back um, just singing the praises of of um, of these countries. And then after that, you know, when a, a bit more information would start, you know, leaking out, and and people would start realizing that oh, this isn't all it was all it was cut out to be, then they'd just say oh, well, actually. Well, so first it was yes, this is the gr a great socialist experiment. It's like socialism is finally you know here and and it's doing great. Then as soon as all the bad stuff came out, it was well that wasn't really real socialism. It never was. And then they move on to the new like uh, socialist utopia, which might have been like Cambodia or North Vietnam. And it's the same like it's the same pattern that happens every time, and it goes like decade by decade. It's like oh Soviet Union not anymore. Okay, we'll move to China. Oh China not anymore. Oh well now let's go to Albania, and so. Each each time it was the same process that uh, the same uh, like the same series of like of reactions that that took place. Um, just uh, I thought the like the irony of it was that um, for the for the like the social socialist countries that were arguably doing the best job, which was like the East Germany. East Germany was like the um, well economically was doing the best out of any of the like socialist countries at the time. It had the worst reputation. Um, it had the least number of people that were actually looking to it as the as this socialist utopia. Um, you know, they were more the the like the the, the Western leftists were more into um, like the countries I mentioned, like first you know, well, Soviet Union, Maoist China, um, the Khmer Rouge in uh, Cambodia, and um, like Cuba, and etc. But the the GDR had its you know some of its supporters but never as many as any of the like the new the new experiments because each new experiment was like a new a new opportunity for socialism to be tr to be proved right and this is why this is actually how the um the dissimulative phase manages to um um to kind of work in in like in a pathocracy it's because because the because socialism has such great ideals like uh, great like aspirations. It's like it's hard to look at the aspirations of of socialism and disagree with them. It's like oh well you know, mm -hmm. you know w workers should have a say and they shouldn't be and people shouldn't be oppressed and everyone should be living together you know in harmony. It's like oh well, yeah that'd be great. It's like how can you not get behind that? But then um, it was so it's the power of those aspirations that um, that that is the fuel for like that that pathocracy uses in order to maintain itself over. You know, several years. It's because they can put up that image. So the, the you know the Soviet Union could put itself forward as a socialist economy that that worked. You know, it may have, may have had its problems, but um, but it's still like a live option. And that um, that was kind of the that was the Lobachevsky would say that was kind of the mask with which the Soviet Union was able to survive for so long, um, like internationally. You had, of course, all of the like anti-communist propaganda coming out of the West, but um, th without the acknowledgement of the system as being like psychopathological in nature, um, it was able, it was still able to survive even despite all of the like all of the propaganda and the Cold War. But the the main point Lobachevsky is making is that if a path like a basically a like a psychological diagnosis were to be made of a, of a country, and it for for it to be widely recognized and understood, that would be the end of the of the pathocracy. It's like it would it wouldn't be able to survive any longer. That's why you know he he thinks or he thought that these ideas were so important. Is that that that's really the Achilles heel of the the pathocratic system is making an accurate diagnosis. Um, and one of the examples that came to mind, you know, while reading was the I mentioned how. In this dissimulative phase, it's necessary for like a pathocratic leadership to to choose like international diplomats essentially to be relatively normal in order to be able to um, like interact with people in other countries and not be so obviously pathological that um, you know because can you imagine like um, just imagine like ISIS having like a a foreign ministry that sends out like you know. Um, the, that like Omar the Chechen or whatever to to do international diplomacy like it wouldn't work right already because they have they have the the rightful reputation of being just a bunch of like you know um, you know savage barbarians but that would be kind of like an extreme version of the this kind of dynamic what you need is you have to pick someone who's presentable and um, in order to maintain your image as being a um, you know relatively a relatively normal group of people, 
and like with emphasis on the term relative because you know politicians normally aren't very normal people like uh, it tends to select the you know political life tends to select people that are already aren't very normal um so uh, so even then you have to you have to make an effort um and the example that came to mind was like Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. where um because um, you've got a guy like, uh, well, I think Prince Mohammed, is, you know, he's doing a good job at, at being that kind of the face of, of a, um, you know, a reformer and a great guy. When you actually look at the, the Saudi system, I mean, it's pathological to the core. And, um, like I'm, uh, I can't remember the name of the documentary, but it came out a couple of years ago and it was, a it was, um, I think it was done by a, a news channel, but they basically got cameras into, into Saudi Arabia and just did a, a like a, to took a look at life there and what it's really like, you know, what the morality police are like and, um, um, the, the kind of the, the, the place and the, like the position of, um, like dissident groups and, and critics of the government. And it just, you know, came across, you know, it was like, it was like looking at a, um, like a real life example of everything that, uh, Lobachevsky talks about. It was like looking at a, a pathocracy, um, like this system of government that is totally repressive, um, and, um, like in reality, um, like a complete nightmare, but the, the image that is projected into the international sphere is one of at least relative normality. Of course, there's a lot of, um, criticism and, um, you know, things that come out about the, you know, the number of executions and the methods of execution and, the um, like the, the whole, um, you know, anti-feminist, I guess you could say like, um, like politics, but even then, even all of that seems relatively normal when you're looking at it and again emphasis on the term relatively it's like not normal but at least um normal enough that there isn't like totally widespread condemnation of the saudi government because you could imagine like certain things coming out to the point where the u.s couldn't um um like couldn't even put up the pretense of of like supporting the system um, and the only way they managed to do that is by downplaying the the realities um, so imagine everything coming out and being publicly known about like about Yemen, and a lot of that is coming out. So that's a you know at least that's a positive that th that stuff is coming out. But everything down to like the daily life of um, you know average um, Saudi citizens, when that would happen, um, and, and if like a psychological like diagnosis were to be made, that would be the end of the you know the 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 Saudi kingdom. There would have to be you know major efforts at uh, PR reform or actual reform. Um, well, and actually that's already happening. Like, I think that the, what bad coverage there is, is largely probably, um, um, like an impetus for the, the recent efforts to, um, to present, you know, Saudi Arabia as moving in the right direction and instituting these reforms and giving more rights to like women in society and all that. But I think all of that is Probably even all of that would be too little too late if, you know, everything else were to be exposed. But, uh, you know, that just a sidebar over on that. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how much of a digression this is. Maybe, um, maybe this can be worked into the discussion a little bit. Earlier in the week, we were, uh, we were talking about a YouTube personality named Steven Crowder, who is this kind of crass comedian, uh, public commentator, who is... Um, He's not politically correct. Uh, you know, he, he makes fun of his, um, his, his staff uh, racially, uh, sexually. Um, he, he is kind of uh, this in-your-face uh, personality that, that a lot of people tune into. And, um, and quite recently, uh, there was this uh, journalist by the name of Carlos Maza, from uh, Vox, who took issue with a lot of Crowder's uh, insults. And, um, and uh, Carlos Maza is a um, very effeminate gay man, uh, Latin. Um, and basically, he, uh, in, in response to uh, Crowder's um, kind of uh, criticism of, of some of the things that that Maza has been saying and doing, uh, which may in fact be legitimate, uh, Maza ranted and raved uh, to YouTube about uh, about Crowder's um, kind of uh, behavior, and um, 
And so YouTube said, basically, you know, Crowder is well within his, his uh, rights in terms of agreement with YouTube. Uh, and he, you know, there's not much that they were willing to do. But, uh, but Mazza doubled down on Crowder. And so what, what this kind of uh, pushed YouTube to do, given the amount of attention it began to get from the major media, uh, the Washington Post and uh, I think the Daily Beast and a few other media outlets in Washington, was to demonetize Steven Crowder, was to basically um, leave his videos intact, but to not permit him to uh, earn any money uh, through sponsorship on YouTube, um, so basically, the, this all all this Carlos Maza had to do, this one guy, uh, is to is to yell uh, vociferously enough about uh, about the offensiveness of Steven Crowder, in order to basically take away his livelihood, uh, which was which was these these programs. Um, and it, it's quite interesting because Carlos Maza has been, you know, speaking in support of in support of groups like Antifa, uh, has has tweeted about humiliating people that he didn't agree with on the right or who were who were somewhat conservative. So, at at the at the risk of beating this dead horse um, that that we've been discussing for many months now, this whole this whole kind of uh, this germ of a pathocracy uh, of of the far left in the United States has is quite willing to support violence in its in in the uh, imposition of leftist policies in the form of Antifa. It's quite willing to uh, to insult people, to encourage others to humiliate others uh, publicly. Um, in in rather uh, awful ways, but then when it happens by a by to them, it it has suddenly become verboten. It is suddenly this this kind of a thought crime that uh, that the the kind of forces behind the mainstream media, the corporate media, get behind, and and enforce this societal uh, ostracization of the individual. So. Um, the reason I mention this is because I, I see this as part of a constellation of, of radical left policies and thinking that have everything to do with uh, an emotional fervor to, to destroy the enemy uh, for people that, that shouldn't be enemies, that should just be acknowledged as people who have different moral taste buds, people who, who see things differently, even if you don't like them. Even if you even if you find how they say things uh, as distasteful, um, and the and the truth of the matter is, at this time in in the U.S., the right or or the conservative branch of of the population does not have the the same power over over this radical left leaning uh, um, sentiment that we're seeing in the in the um, the censorship and and the uh, the the kind of um, squelching of voices that we're seeing against the the more conservative and uh, and commonsensical uh, voices out there. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that you know it's beating a, a dead horse because we we are witnessing uh, polarology in action. We're witnessing polarization process in action, and when you and it gives you a chance to to look at it and you know if you're reading phonology and you're following daily events you're able to kind of pick out some of the things that are that are happening and harrison you talked a little bit about the st stuff that we covered in you know the phases of pathocracy that we covered in previous shows and people like this carlos gentleman i don't remember his, his full name but maza. carlos maza so he's a lot like the like the character of paths that brutalize um, an ideology and really contribute to its warping into into its complete counterpart. Of course, he's not alone. There's countless other people who have been busy doing that. And you know, I spent a lot of time trying to think. I was like, "What ideology is it?" It doesn't seem like there is an ideology, 
But of course, it's you know postmodernism. That deep down, it's just the postmodern ideology, and in its many different forms, it was in it just circulated in very small groups, exactly like Lobachevsky uh, discusses in the book. That it you know it was intersectionality. It was you know all these different kinds of ways of viewing the world in terms of oppression or oppressor. It was, you know, the philosophers who spoke about there being no truth, about, you know, there being no reality. Everybody basically creates their own reality through linguistics and narratives, and there should be no meta narrative, even though, you know, that is a meta narrative. But anyhow, it was these, uh, these ideologies that were created by most likely a lot of very schizoidal people who just wanted to create a castle to live in, uh, you know, floating in the air. And then it was people like this Carlos Maza who then weaponize it, who take it, and then they take it into the streets because they can sniff out how to use it against people that they don't like. So, you know, you know, you know, Stephen Crowder, I, th- I haven't listened to what he said, but I listened to Glenn Greenwald's <laughs> take on it and apparently you know apparently he said some you know very crass and very naughty things about about this gentleman and you know basically he was he pulled no punches basically barroom brawl talk about you know him and his conduct and who and the way this guy reacted he probably i can't can you say it he probably deserved it but um the then the way he reacted so it's to use the this intersectional you know i'm oppressed i'm an oppressor or i'm i'm being oppressed by this white man and to whip up everybody into go into ruining this guy's life uh or not ruining his life but taking away his livelihood even though at this point you are not the oppressed you are not the weak victim you have all of the power and you are using it to crush a marginalized oppressed person it's not it's it's absolutely phenomenally lunacy it's phenomenal lunacy but at the same time that's exactly what lobachevsky talks about this that's what happens is that you have character pathic individuals who who weaponize ideologies in order to you know use them to their own advantage and then over time as the process goes on then you get more and more just snakes that that just creep in and 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 continue turning it into its total pathological counterpart, where it is basically, you know, Satan in the sheep, the sheepskin. <laughs> well, uh, maybe on that point, just one final point from this chapter uh, that relates to that. Lobachevsky talks about how the it is the original like believers in the ideology that are the first to become the most bitter once you know, their vision is actually enacted, put into place. Um, so as a warning to the people that are kind of enamored of the this kind of like new identity politics and the, the way that it's taking shape in you know, Western societies primarily, um, just, you know, keep this in mind. The way it would progress is something like this, is that you're, you're, on, you're on the backs of this great social movement um, that is... Um, you know, fighting for equality and social justice and diversity and inclusivity and all these things. Great things, right? That's what, uh, that's what you think. So then because of the, the kind of um, like street efforts of the, the, the pushers of this kind of ideology, let's just say that it, it was totally put into, uh, into power. So you had the first um, like truly progressive like president who made all of these things pos- uh, like uh, all of these things policy, and you had you know a Congress and Senate that managed to put it all in, or you know some of the features of the American system were kind of dissolved just to make it uh, just to help the process along. Well, the historically, it is those supporters who are like the first on the chopping block. Essentially, they're they're the ones that that look and say, "Well, hey, wait a second, this isn't." what I was actually fighting for. So as bad as, you know, as bad as identity politics is now, it will, it will get worse to the point where all the true believers in all of these identity politics, like talking points will be the ones criticizing the new system saying, Oh, that's not really what we're talking about. Like what, like what's going on. And then you're, you're going to be the first ones to, 
to be criticizing. Well, not the first ones, but you're going to be, um, you know, on the, um, on I'm the vanguard of, of, of all these people that are against the, against the new system. So what, uh, this gets into just one last point from, uh, from Ponderology. Um, this, first of all, is kind of what I was alluding to back when I was uh, talking about socialism. He writes, however, it must be understood that the primary ideology was undoubtedly socially dynamic and, crea and contained creative elements. Otherwise, it would have been incapable of nurturing and protecting the pathocratic phenomenon from recognition and criticism for very long. So this is, most, this is I guess, um, more applicable to socialism and what I talked about, like the, the socialist um, aspirations as being something that, um, like most people in, in the, the left part of the political spectrum couldn't really disagree with. Like that's the reason that like a, a socialist government can last for so long or a pathocratic government using uh, socialism as its ideology. Um, but then he, Lobachevsky goes on to like get a closer definition of what pathocracy means. So this is the last paragraph of that, of this section. He writes, defining the moment at which a movement has been transformed into something we can call a pathocracy as a result of the ponderogenic process is a matter of convention. The process is, tempor is temporally cumulative and reaches a point of no return at some particular moment. Eventually, however, internal confrontation with the adherence of the original ideology occurs, thus finally affixing the seal of the pathocratic character of the phenomenon. Nazism most certainly passed this point of no return, but was prevented from all-out confrontation with the adherents of the original ideology because the Allied armies smashed its military might. <clears throat> so what he's basically saying is that the like the 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 first thing that will that will make a pathocracy a pathocracy, like visibly and like um, uncontrovertibly so, is when the pathocratic government goes after the original adherents of the ideology. So this is you often see like from le from commentators on the right, like conservative outlets talking about the left eating itself. So you find former progressives that are you know that are then put on the chopping block of the of the identity politics left. Well, that's nothing compared to what's happening or what's coming. Um, it will be a literal chopping block in a lot of click cases where um, where all these supporters of these identity politics policies and just viewpoints will be the ones doing a lot of the suffering. Um, they will be the ones targeted. So it won't just be the, you know, the people on the right. It'll actually be the left too, to the point where, um, you know, it's everyone against this tiny minority of, of people in charge. And then you get something that is actually worse than, um, than what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. And worse than the things that the, the, the critics on the left are criticizing. So essentially, they will essentially they will base if things go according to this you know pathocratic plan, then the you know the left today will be the the creators of a system like far worse than the thing that they are criticizing in the first place. So I just think that uh, people should keep that in mind when they um, want to get politically active, you know, for a cause like uh, you know inclusivity, diversity, and you know equity. Yeah, not only that, but by lumping, uh, I just I watched a really great video by Brett Weinstein uh, earlier, and he discusses the fact that uh, by lumping all white men together and trying to you know ostracize them and repress them, you run the risk of creating the the enemy that you supposedly hate, mm -hmm. that you're supposedly out to destroy. Now, clearly, uh, at some level, this is. They want this. Peop, that's what they want. Uh, a lot of these people leading these movements, they need that enemy. They need white supremacy. They need reaction. They need violence. They need lashing out. And people will lash out if they get backed into a corner. But, and, you know, so obviously, probably not a lot of our listeners are on the fence with identity politics. But, um, you know, if, <laughs> if you are. <laughs> Then, as Harrison pointed out, like these, this ideology is not what you think it is. It's nothing like what it once was. You know, even if it, if it, even if it did have some positive characteristics, that at this point in time, it is out to create hell on earth. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add, Corey, because I had the, a similar. 
kind of thought on that is that the the reaction to uh, this radical left movement can also take the form of a political movement mm-hmm. that could, in fact, be very successful and and be so reactionary in its uh, in its response to the policies and and attitudes and behavior of the of the left that we've been seeing in the past five ten years that uh, you know like you were saying Harrison it it could it could very well create a system that that is far worse than anything that we're that we're seeing today and that is going to make in- inequality sound like a, a Sunday picnic uh, compared to the 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 kind of reaction uh, that may be uh, that we may be seeing from a far right group. Well, and I'm not I'm not a betting man, but <laughs> if I were to be a, if I were to place a bet on whether it's the you know the left have the future you know c- control this this uh, focus on you know the the dispossessed and minorities or a radicalized. <laughs> right you know led by people who just years ago were advocating torture and the murder of you know just illegal invasion after illegal invasion i would put my money on the these radical loonies on the right but i'm not a betting man well and with that said i think we'll uh, call it a day there so thanks for tuning in everyone and uh, we'll see you later